This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. Ever tried sleeping on an airplane? The key word there is tried. It doesn't matter whether I'm flying economy or super-duper first class, I've always struggled to get even a little bit of sleep on a plane. But then my wife gave me a turtle pillow. The turtle pillow is the most comfortable travel pillow in the world, making plane sleep possible. Designed by engineers, the wildly popular turtle, that's T-R-T-L, travel pillow, holds your head and neck in a better position than standard U-shaped pillows. Check out Turtle's Neck Pillows and other travel products at trtltravel.com. That's trtltravel.com. Use the code KICK for 20% off. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis. Welcome to Kick-Ass News. As of this recording, the record for the oldest person who ever lived belongs to Jean Calmont, who died in France in 1997 at the ripe old age of 122. The oldest living man who's ever been verified was Jiroman Kamuri of Japan, who made it to 116. And then there's my guest today, the creator of Bulletproof Coffee and the man who started the whole biohacking craze, Dave Asprey, who says he plans to live to 180. He writes about it in his new book, Superhuman, the bulletproof plan to age backward and maybe even live forever. And today, Dave joins me on the podcast to explain why 180 is the magic number for him and how he plans to get there. He opens up about a traumatic health crisis that got him interested in health and longevity as a teenager and his battle with early cognitive decline that set him on a path to hacking the human brain. He reveals the culprit behind most age-related diseases, including the ones that he refers to as the four killers. He shares the one food that he never eats, the benefits of periodic fasting, and how he manages to feel more rested on less sleep. We talk about the importance of light, gut health, and even jaw alignment to our wellness. Plus, he describes some of the most cutting-edge treatments that he's tried, from stem cell injections to blood transfusions, including a couple he wished he hadn't, and reveals why the Russians may have the inside track on hacking longevity. Coming up with Dave Asprey in just a moment. Dave Asprey is a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur, professional biohacker, the creator of Bulletproof Coffee, and the host of the Bulletproof Radio podcast. He's also the New York Times bestselling author of Game Changers, Headstrong, and the Bulletproof Diet. Now he's attempting to perform the ultimate biohack, Cheating Death, in his latest book, Superhuman, the Bulletproof Plan to Age Backward and Maybe Even Live Forever. Dave Asprey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, Dave, I have to say, you certainly have an ambitious goal in this book. You say in here that you plan to live to 180. I guess my first question is, how'd you come up with that number? Why not 170 or 250? Or for that matter, why not forever? Forever might be possible someday, but I think dying at a time and by a method of my own choosing is a pretty good goal. (laughs) Okay. So why is 180? (laughs) Why is 180 real? Uh, 180 is real because we know that we can do 120 right now because we've Mm -hmm. seen it. And these are people who have lived the last 120 years. Mm -hmm. A hundred years ago, we were still fighting parts of World War I on horseback. So a lot (laughs) changes in a hundred years. So if we know our best today is 120, maybe in the next hundred years, we could only do 50% better. In fact, I'm betting that because for the last 20 years, I've run an anti-aging nonprofit group. I've interviewed hundreds of the world's leaders in this. I have been involved. In fact, biohacking, uh, the word, the whole thing, I'm considered the father of biohacking, Mm -hmm. and it's a new word in our dictionary as of 2018. And what's going on there is we have been studying this for thousands of years as a species. How do we live longer? The Ayurvedic tradition out of India the Taoist and 
Chinese uh, traditional Chinese medicine paths. Uh, even some of the things around alchemy in Europe were all the quest to be immortal. The fountain of youth is nothing new. What's new is the internet, machine learning, <laughs> genetics, mitochondria. And I know the guys doing the work and the women doing the work. And what we have now is a revolution where we know why we get old and what to do about it. And this is the first time in human history that we know of we've been able to say that. Yeah, I believe that the oldest living man that's ever been verified lived to, I think, 116. So I wish you the very best of luck. Uh, if you think that you can best him by 64 years in the next few decades, good for you. The good news is I'm in my 40s. <laughs> right. I've got a lot of tech that he didn't have access to. I've also talked to a lot of longevity experts, and one thing that they tell me is that the biggest hurdle is just simply the fact that cell regeneration, at least as we understand it now, is finite. We only have so many cycles of new cells in us before we stop making new cells and we die. How do you plan to overcome that? It, it's funny. There was a group of uh, people who said that if we went over something like 16 miles an hour, that all the oxygen would leave our vehicle and we would die of <laughs> lack of oxygen. Um, they were criticizing the creation of the automobile. <laughs> so, um, okay. you know, I, I will say, though, there's a chapter in Superhuman on stem cells. And what I do to write a book like this is I go out and I try everything as a, as a guinea pig. So yeah. I've had the most extensive stem cell treatment ever to have been done on one person at one time where I had a half a liter of my bone marrow taken out and my fat stem cells injected into every joint in my body, inside my spine, outside my spine, in my brain, in my reproductive organs, everywhere. And I talked to the people doing the research, and it turns out we already know, and this is in Superhuman, how to take adult stem cells and de-differentiate them. We can take our stem cells and make them into what's called a pluripotent cell, which will go in and rebuild tissue. It turns out, though, oh. tissue loss is only one of the seven pillars of aging that are in the book. So that's how you address tissue loss is you program your stem cells to do the stuff that Mother Nature isn't programming them to do because Mother Nature wants you to die. Interesting. Uh, so we can do that. And, and this is not uh, cord blood stem cells or fetal stem cells. These are your own stem cells at age 40, huh? These are your own stem cells, but really the most the, the best ones are stem cells from the blood of your enemies, if you can get those just because there's that extra. Okay. <laughs> but basically use your own stem cells. One uh, One problem we have is... Stem cells that uh, come from some other source, you usually don't get very many of them in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And in other countries right now, people are taking their stem cells and growing them in a lab. So you can get hundreds of millions of cells that weren't already in your body. So that's what I did. I had my blood drawn here, and then I went out of the country to get the treatments. I'm hoping that the regulatory system in the U.S. catches up with the rest of the world, and soon we'll be free to use our own cells as we choose. Yeah, and that's interesting because, you know, being the well-known biohacker that you are, you describe personally trying a number of these more cutting-edge and experimental treatments, many of which are not yet approved by the FDA and still in clinical trials, or as in this case, you have to go to another country to do them. Doesn't that scare you? How do you personally weigh the risk versus reward of a particular treatment? You know what scares me? Being old. <laughs> I was old when I was young. I, I had all yeah. the diseases of aging before I was 30. I was obese, I was pre-diabetic, high risk of stroke and heart attack, cognitive dysfunction, uh, arthritis when I was 14. And I know what it's like to, to push the accelerator all the way down and still be slowing down. And like you can push harder, but you got nothing left. And, and it's a sense of helplessness and a mm -hmm. sense of a kind of creeping horror. It's like, I don't know what to do here. I don't want to go back to that. I don't like walking around with a knee brace and in pain all the time. I don't have any of that. I have a brain that works better now at 46 than at 26. So you know what? If you do nothing, you will spend the last 20 years of your life in decline, in pain, reliant on other people, and going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. That scares the crap out of me. An experimental treatment that has a great basis for working done by people who have put their life's work into it that actually works and has worked on other people, why is that not allowed? Why don't I, why don't I get to get that choice? Who, ha, who dares to just presume that they have a right to tell me I have to have a permission slip? to take care of my own biology. That is my mm -hmm. fundamental human right. And if you want to get in the way of that, you are an enemy of humanity. 
Well, I want to talk about this experience that you just mentioned. Uh, apparently, when you were at a very young age, you literally found out that you were aging beyond your years. What was going on with your body back then? You know, it was really scary. At 14, I'm like, man, my knees hurt all the time. But I just thought they were supposed to hurt all the time. So I went to the doctor and he just said, you have arthritis in your knees and here's a brace. In fact, here's two braces. You can keep playing soccer. And I just remember going home and saying, I thought arthritis was you know, for old people and I'm 14. And, and I was sort of deeply disturbed, like maybe there's something wrong with me. And it turns out there was. I was living in a house that had toxic mold growing inside the walls because it had been flooded. And we didn't know about toxic mold in the 80s. But I had nosebleeds all the time. I had weird inflammation throughout my body. I ended up gaining a lot of weight and developed autoimmune conditions. It turns out they also run in my family. I also said, I'm going to eat healthy. So I would do the bran muffins, the low-fat diets, uh, the high-carb diets that were supposed to be healthy because they had fiber, even though they had inflammatory agents in them. By the time I was in my early 20s, I hit 300 pounds. And I was exercising an hour and a half a day six days a week. And I was eating a low-fat, low-calorie diet because I was desperate to not have another knee surgery. Wow. And at the end, 18 months of this, I'm talking every day but Sunday. I didn't care if I didn't sleep. I didn't care if I was sick. I didn't care if I had final exams. I hit the gym because it was most important. I looked down, 46-inch waist, the same as when I started, still weighed 300 pounds. I, I could max out all the machines. I'm not saying it didn't help, but I was still fat and I was still tired and it just pissed me off. And my conclusion was that I was a moral failure because I clearly ate too much lettuce while my friends ate their <laughs> cheeseburgers. And it was, it was just coming to that conclusion, wait a minute, maybe this doesn't work. And I'm suffering all the time. I'm hungry all the time. Uh, you will lose to hunger eventually, no matter how much willpower you have. So yeah. I ended up starting to work with people two and three times my age who are running an anti-aging nonprofit research group. And the yeah. stuff that made them young fixed me and became the basis for biohacking. Yeah, and I believe this is when you learned about the importance of mitochondria to aging. That's something that doesn't get nearly as much attention as inflammation or maybe telomerase, but I believe that you suggest that mitochondrial dysfunction is at the root of a lot of inflammation and thus aging. Can you explain the connection? One of the seven pillars of aging that I cover in Headstrong is called mitochondrial mutations. And your mitochondria's primary job is to sense the environment around you, and based on what it senses, it takes food and air, and it makes energy or it makes chemicals for you. And primarily energy is the big thing. So if the mitochondria do a bad job of turning air and food into energy, you will always have inflammation. You will also eventually have diabetes because diabetes is what happens when your cells can't turn food, that's called sugar, uh, into energy. <laughs> so you fix the mitochondria, you fix the diabetes, you fix the diabetes, your risk of the other four killers that I outline in the book, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's, they go down precipitously just from fixing the mitochondria, which fixes blood sugar, which unleashes a wave of energy in the body, literally a wave of energy. Yeah, and you mentioned these four killers. Those are the four diseases that I believe most people end up dying of, right? It, it's kind of funny, and it's obvious when you put it this way, but the first step to living to 180 is not dying. <laughs> so like, what's likely to kill us? Let's just look at the yeah. odds. The good news is those are odds for average people. Mm -hmm. Now that you've heard this episode, maybe you'll read the book, and maybe you're just paying attention more than many other people, so you're probably not average. But even so, the odds of you getting taken out by cancer, cardiovascular, disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's is exceptionally high. Mm -hmm. Oh, and if you're a woman, your odds of getting Alzheimer's is much higher than if you're a man. Yeah. Uh, so they don't strike each of the sexes equally either. Right. So you might as well re just reduce your risk. And it's not about perfection. It's not about not even avoiding these things entirely. It's just like, what if you could do something that didn't cost you anything? It didn't take time. It didn't take dollars. It didn't even take much attention. You just changed a habit because now we know that something you did before it, it causes more damage over time. Mm -hmm. Let's just do less of what makes us weak. Yeah. That alone is probably going to get you at least greater health span and maybe an extra 5, 10 years. I'm thinking bigger than that. You don't have to go as big as I'm going. In fact, most people won't because some of what I'm doing isn't affordable enough yet. It will be in your lifetime. It's just not affordable enough yet. And it's pretty powerful stuff. 
Yeah, you describe aging as a death by a thousand cuts, which makes me kind of think of that old movie, uh, what was it, Death Becomes Her with Goldie Hawn and Meryl Streep, where <laughs> you know, they're going to live forever, but they've only got one body. So <laughs> you just keep taking one hit after another or one cut after another. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of this comes down to what you put in your bodies. Um, are there certain foods that you absolutely avoid at all times? Yeah, one of the foods that I, I wish I wasn't going to talk about is fried food. <laughs> we all kind of know in the back of our mind, oh, yeah, of course it's not good for us, but it's sure. fried calamari, it's fried Brussels sprouts, but it's, you know, it's a nice French fries. Look, I don't care if you take organic yams raised by monks and you fry them in duck fat from left-handed ducks. It's still fried and it creates all kinds of compounds that create more inflammation in your body for two days than smoking a cigarette, which is only going to last four to eight hours. In fact, there's a chapter in the book about how low-dose nicotine, not smoking, we're talking about nicotine separate from tobacco. Gum and whatnot. To cure for Alzheimer's disease. It is a treatment. Since 1988, it has been studied at Vanderbilt University. So there's a protocol in the book for how to use low-dose nicotine, not vaping, not smoking, not tobacco, but nicotine, in order to keep your brain younger. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, if you have a plate of French fries or a cigarette, the cigarette's probably healthier, but man, why would you do either one? <laughs> Really? Yeah. I want to ask you about that because I know that you've worked with Dr. Daniel Amen, who's a big brain guy, and I've had him on before. I asked him about nicotine, and he personally wasn't a big fan of the use of nicotine <laughs> for brain activity. Uh, but it's something that I've heard from a lot of tech guys and scientists who use nicotine gum as a biohack. Yeah, I, I kind of started that trend. Um, <laughs> if, if you if you look around, like <laughs> kind of okay. dig back through the the archives there, that that's one of the biohacks I popularized. Yeah. And it's possible to overdo nicotine. And Daniel Amen is a dear friend. His work 20 years ago helped me understand I had a hardware problem, not a moral failing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm eternally grateful to him and, and his, his pioneering work. Uh, and we talk frequently. So um, in this case, he'll tell you smoking is not good for you. But if you were to ask him, hey, what is one milligram of nicotine per day going to do for you? You might get a different answer than, okay. oh, I'm just going to, you know, hit a few sticks of nicotine gum, and I'm going to go pound out the code. Uh, it also depends on your age. The protocols in Superhuman are saying, look, in your 40s, a milligram a day. In your 50s, probably two, maybe three. And you go up a milligram or two per decade. And the deal here is it really does help with Alzheimer's disease. And mm. as you age, your mitochondria get worse at turning food and air into energy. And low-dose nicotine makes your mitochondria work better. It actually is an exercise mimetic. So it makes your cells believe that you exercise through exactly the same mechanism as exercise itself. It's called PGC1-alpha. So who would have thought that a little spray of nicotine or a half a piece of nicotine gum, by the way, Lucy gum is the lowest toxin nicotine gum out there that doesn't have the, the artificial sweeteners that are bad for you. Okay. And um, so we're talking half a piece of this stuff. Huh. And you, you do this, and you're like, wow, my brain really, really rocks. And if you're 20 and you do this, your brain is really going to rock too. But you might not want to get a strong nicotine habit that's going to be too much nicotine over time. So the dose makes the poison for almost everything. But nicotine mm. in low doses really, really can help the brain. And Daniel Amen is directionally right. Don't start smoking, don't start vaping, and don't become a heavy nicotine user. Okay. You won't like what happens. Okay. Well, I want to ask you about your chapter on brain health because that's another chapter that's fairly personal for you. Uh, you describe having suffered from what you call premature cognitive decline or worrying that you might be a candidate for early onset Alzheimer's. Before you sought treatment, what were the kind of things that you were having trouble with? I would lose words. I, I couldn't remember mm -hmm. stuff. I'd say, oh, what was the word? I was thinking of something. And I'd open the fridge. I wouldn't know why I opened it. I'd go to the store. And I didn't know why I went to the store. And I'd sit in meetings, and I couldn't remember anything. Things that were important, things that I cared about, things that I wanted, they were just leaving me. And sometimes I'd drive home, and I'd get home, and I'd say, I have no recollection of how I got home. I, I know I must have driven, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. Wow. Uh, to, the, to the point that I bought disability insurance in my mid-20s because I'm like, huh. all the tests say I'm fine, but man, I'm, I'm scared. And this wasn't paranoia, anxiety, worry, although I had high anxiety. This was actually a hardware problem in my brain. When I finally, in my, when I was about 30, I went to Wharton, the business school, and 
Um, I was having a hard time finishing my tests and I thought, man, I know I'm pretty smart, but maybe I'm dumber than all of my friends in school <laughs> here. Uh, so I went and I sought out uh, Daniel Amen because he had just written his first book. And I had radioactive sugar injected in my arm and we looked at my brain and lo and behold, I had chemical induced toxic brain damage. And it was caused by toxic mold in the home where I had grown up in the house where I lived. And I healed it. My most recent scan, the damage is gone. Wow. So you can grow your brain back. It's that straightforward. That's incredible. What did you do to heal your brain? Well, one of the things you have to do is you stop eating the bad fats because the cells okay. in your brain are made out of fat. It takes you two years to replace half the fat in your cell membranes. Hmm. And in superhuman, I found some really neat new research that explains how when you eat fat, where it goes in the body. It turns out that your brain really, really, really wants you to have saturated fat in the brain. 45% of the fat in your brain is saturated, and it will not change no matter what you do. But you have great control over the mix of other fats in the brain. So what I did is I went on a high-fat diet to get to allow myself to get rid of the bad fats that had built up in my body over time, both from bad bacteria in my gut and from eating the wrong fats when I was a raw vegan and things like that. And I'm talking egg yolks, grass-fed butter, grass-fed steak, coconuts, uh, avocados, all that kind of stuff. And it makes a big difference, but I didn't fry it. I didn't cook it at high temperatures. I ate my guacamole. And over time, it starts to build new cells. Fish oil is important. Krill oil is important. And I also got rid of the other inflammatory agents. You ditch the grains. Look, I love a croissant or a donut, but look, they're not food for high-performance humans. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of the grains. And I don't care if it's a gluten-free grain, sorghum and all that sort of stuff. All plant babies don't want you to eat them because they can't run away. They can't do anything to stop you. They just wrap themselves in poison. And you get the 1970s whole foods, you know, plant-based diet uh, people in their last gasp of being wrong. And what they will tell you is, but they have fiber. And here's the deal. Broccoli has fiber too. It just isn't wrapped with lectins and other chemicals that poke holes in your gut that are designed to keep animals from eating the plant babies. Mm -hmm. So you stop doing those things. To so eat more good fats, get rid of the whole grains. Magically, things start to work again. So you're not a big proponent of the China study and veganism as a biohack to longevity. I am a fan of doing anything in your environment that changes your biology in the way you want. I was a devout raw vegan for quite a while. I would, went all in. I bought the blender. I bought the big bowls. I can still whip up a mean, high toxin, inflammatory vegan dessert. Uh, and I, I went all in on it. And you know what it did? It gave me worse autoimmune conditions. It made my teeth crack and it made me sick. I am oh, wow. a highly educated, <laughs> very focused guy. I did all the research. I did everything right. And you know what? Plants want to kill you. This was a part of the Bulletproof Diet in 2014. I wrote about lectins. I wrote about oxalic acid, all the things that plants do to stop us from eating them, all the reasons that we cook our food and all the reasons that we eat animals. And the China study is wrong on so many levels, but the biggest thing it got wrong is in the very first chapter where in a bizarre type of logic, Colin Campbell writes and he says, well, if you take this one kind of animal protein, which is called casein, it's a milk protein that's extracted from milk, and you give it to rats, it increases their risk of liver cancer dramatically. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all animal proteins are bad for you. Now, I'm going to use this vegan logic on a couple other things for you, Ben. Okay. <laughs> so my favorite plant-based protein is ricin, the nerve gas. You know, the one that killed all the people in the Tokyo subway attack? It's yeah. a plant-based protein. Therefore, <laughs> all plant-based proteins will kill you. I have it there. It's scientific. I'm going to call it the... Japan study? It, it, it's completely <laughs> stupid. It's not how you do it. Different okay. proteins do different things. By the way, spider venom is an animal-based protein. I don't eat that. So let's throw out the plant-based versus animal-based, and let's look at which protein was it, how was it raised, how did you store it, and how did you cook it, and how mm. much of it did you eat, and even what time of day did you eat. And when you sort through all the BS on both sides of the debate, what you find is the people who eat primarily vegetables – and less grains, and some high-quality grass-fed animal protein, not too much the way we do it today, mm -hmm. and lots of ghee or butter or other fats as available in their environment, those are the people who do the best. Okay. And you can find Fair it enough. 
in the Kitavans who eat tons and tons of starch and tons and tons of coconut. It's okay. okay. You can find the Maori tribes people who eat primarily full fat milk and blood of cows, and they all do well. Mm -hmm. So there's a wide variety there, but those are the rules. And to say animal protein is good or bad, it's like saying a liquid diet is good or bad. Is the liquid gasoline or water? Because you might have different results. So like <laughs> that, that whole China study thing, it's just bad thinking. It's not even yeah. bad science. Now, you're also a big proponent of fasting or periodic fasting. I hear a lot of Silicon Valley guys using fasting as a productivity hack these days. Uh, what kind of fast do you do? Well, the, uh, the bulletproof intermittent fast is one of the things that put fasting on the map. Mm -hmm. And what I do there is you wake up and you have a bulletproof coffee in the morning. And by now, I'm guessing most listeners have heard of bulletproof coffee. Sure, of course. Uh, but here's the science behind that. When you fast, something happens when you don't turn on any of the stuff in your body that digests protein. So there's enzymes that can either repair your cells or go towards tearing apart protein. Well, your Bulletproof coffee has no protein, so those enzymes keep working on your cells. And then something else happens when you secrete insulin. And third parties have shown Bulletproof coffee doesn't raise insulin at all. And the other thing that happens is you get no insulin spike at all, you get no protein spike. So what happens is you have the effects of fasting except the amount of caffeine in two cups of coffee doubles ketone production. Brain oh. octane, which is part of Bulletproof Coffee, raises ketones four times more than coconut oil or the generic MCT oil copycats. So what you end up with there is, wow, my ketones went up. Ketones don't get stored as fat. They have to get burned as energy. So there's actually a kind of fat called energy fats that I write about in the in the new book, Superhuman, where if they can't be stored as fat and they have to be burned, burned as energy, that's pretty good to have that around. So mm -hmm. bulletproof intermittent fasting, you have that for breakfast. The fast is way easier. You have a late lunch and a dinner. So you get 16 to 18 hours where you have no protein, no carbs, and you're fully satisfied and focused. Interesting. Sometimes I do, I do a regular intermittent fast with just black coffee. And once, twice a month, I'll do a 24 to 48 hour fast where I just don't eat. And mm -hmm. people who are fat like I was hear that and go, but I'll die. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll crash. It's You don't. And if you want to make that easier, you can actually do the same bulletproof trick. You have wow. the bulletproof coffee in the morning, a little bit at lunch. You'll be fine. Now, one thing that I also hear a lot about is the impact of gut health on overall health and longevity. But I have to confess, personally... I don't know much about it, and I really don't understand the connection. Uh, how does gut bacteria actually relate to all these other things? It, it's really interesting because we did not understand this even 20 years ago. Your mitochondria, we talked about earlier, they're ancient bacteria that live inside our cells and have become incorporated into our cells. We like to tell ourselves that we harness them to be uh, our power plants. They high-five each other and say that they harness these dumb Petri dishes to hold them and walk around at their command. I think they're right, actually. <laughs> so these bacteria that power us talk to the bacteria in our gut via chemicals, even via light, surprisingly. So when you eat stuff, your gut bacteria metabolizes it and puts stuff into the body that your body then listens to very dramatically. It turns out most of the pharmaceutical drugs that we have in circulation today get metabolized by your gut bacteria into what actually works, and we didn't know it until huh. recently. So you want to live a long time. You want to have more species of gut bacteria, more diversity. So I found out that doing the the even the bulletproof take on keto. In fact, bulletproof was was came out at the very beginning of keto, and it's one of the the things the wind behind keto. Uh, but I had forty eight species of gut bacteria, and ideally, I should have had closer to two hundred if I wanted to have a young person's gut bacteria population. The reason when you travel. There's just no vegetables. It's hard to buy vegetables at restaurants in enough quantity to matter. So I was low on them. So I created a prebiotic. It's a basically tree sap from three different trees. It's called Bulletproof Inner Fuel. Yes, I do make it because it works. And I started taking that, and I published the results in Superhuman. I went from 48 species to 196 species in about three months just by putting two scoops of flavorless powder in my Bulletproof coffee. So wow. radically changed my gut bacteria population with a simple act like that. So if you're on keto and you're listening to this or you're doing fasting, 
the odds are that your gut bacteria are probably wrecked by unending keto. I'm calling that dirty keto. And you've got to go in and out, or you've got to have some carbs to feed the good guys in your gut, okay. but not sugar, not junk fats. Okay. But how do I know if I have good or bad gut health? I mean, you know, I have a stomach of steel, so, you know, I don't have a sensitive stomach like a lot of people. I rarely get a tummy ache. I rarely eat something that doesn't actually agree with me. So my assumption is that I have good gut health. Am I right? Uh, is it that simple or, or, or is there something else that I'm missing here? You're probably you're probably more right than most people. However, you could have some really weird stuff going on in there that is not doing good things for you, but you wouldn't know it, especially if it's always been there. Really? So the gold standard for me is a test called Viome, V-I-O-M-E. And that's where I got my results here. Okay. It runs about $199. You find it on sale sometimes. And what you do is you send in a very small sample, uh, just in a regular envelope. You don't have to do all the crazy lab testing stuff. And they come back and they tell you, here's all the species of bacteria, virus, fungus, and everything else in your gut. Here's what it's doing. So it's not just, is it there? It's what is it doing with food? And they give you a list of foods that are going to cause inflammation and a list of foods that are going to help shift your gut bacteria to be healthy. It turns out they listen okay. to the food you eat way more than anything else, even more than the probiotics you might take. So this is a test that's become very affordable that gives you really gold standard data on what is your gut bacteria doing to you that you don't know about. Now, from the gut to the mouth, uh, another thing that you preach in here is, uh, and this is something that I've never heard of in my life, is the importance of jaw alignment <laughs> to our longevity. What's the connection there? Uh, my goal in Superhuman was after 20 years of doing this, the stuff that no one talks about that has merit, the stuff that's really powerful, I wanted to put that into the public uh, sphere. As you age, your teeth wear down in the back, and it changes the angle of your jaw just a little bit. And a rational person would say, who cares? It doesn't really matter. However, a neuroscientist or someone who's looking at embryology says, wait a minute, that nerve that runs through the jaw there, the trigeminal nerve, that's going to get impinged, and what's it going to do? The people who study this have figured out that it increases levels of the primordial pain compound in all of nature called substance P. Even slime molds have substance P. It's how they know to grow away from things like fire. And well, if your jaw, you have jaw tension, jaw grinding, jaw clenching, and just over time as you age, you get some of that when you sleep anyway, it's going to make you old by increasing inflammation, increasing scoliosis, all kinds of things you'd never expect. So what would happen if you slept with a little bite guard? Especially if you clench your jaws, if you do that one thing, you might buy yourself another 10 years of high-functioning life. It's no that kidding. big of a deal. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Now, another thing that comes up a lot with regard to overall health and longevity is sleep. And I feel like we've kind of recently just begun to turn the corner from this burn the candle at both ends, I'll sleep when I die mentality. But it sounds like you're still somewhere in between. You say that your sleep has improved, but you still only get, I think, about six hours of sleep a night, which is well below the recommended eight or seven to nine hours that they recommend, depending on who you listen to. Uh, are you able to function? function fairly well on just six hours? <laughs> you ever hear them say you should have eight glasses of water a day? <laughs> right. Well, the thing with that is I always wonder, that, I mean, is that just for the average person? Some well, people are heavier than others. So. Yeah, and also how big were the glasses? Right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so there's a lot of advice out there that's garbage advice. And let me just tell you, okay. the really? most granular study of sleep ever done was 1.2 million people followed closely for three years. And that study found, it's the only study so granular you could look at the difference of a half hour of plus or minus sleep. Uh, that study found that, lo and behold, the people who live the longest sleep six and a half hours a night. If you sleep nine hours a night, your odds of dying from all-cause mortality are much higher than the person who sleeps seven hours a night. So what, huh. what's going on okay. there? What's going on there is healthy people need less sleep. <laughs> It's that straightforward. It's not that sleep kills really? or doesn't kill you. Huh. So for me, I don't just perform okay on six hours and 10 minutes, which is my average over the last 10 years of, of, of my life. In the book, I publish my sleep data. And I'll tell you, you go back 10 plus years ago, I'm like I'll sleep when I'm dead. Sleep is a waste of time. I've completely shifted that. But what I want is I want a high return on investment on my sleep. So I'm getting <laughs> two hours of deep sleep, two hours of REM sleep. Sometimes it's only an hour and a half, depending on how much I sleep. But it's crazy. I can get this almost any time I want. 
<coughs> Interesting. I flew to London um, uh, two weeks ago, and I got two hours of deep sleep on the airplane. <laughs> Which, like, wow. how do you do that? That's almost impossible. <laughs> I'm and I'm six four. I don't even fit in the lay down beds, which I was fortunate to be in. So I have a ring that tracks my sleep. And I was a CTO of one of the wristband tracking companies. I'm really into this stuff. And I'll just tell you, if you manage what you do before you go to bed and you have the right supplements and all that, I get more sleep in six hours than you probably get in eight. And it makes wow. such a difference in my quality of life and my productivity. So I'm all over the sleep quality. And sleeping more, it, it just doesn't make sense. It, it's like, you know, why would you drive more when you could drive less? The point was to get there, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. And many people already know about the effects of blue light on sleep. I think you say that they should actually just leave our smartphones on night mode all day long instead of putting on night mode when we go to bed. Should we just avoid blue light altogether? You know, it's really confusing because I, I started a company that's in, you could call it the blue blocking space, but it turns out if you block blue light in the morning or during the day all the way, you should expect to wreck your circadian rhythm and probably die sooner. Mm. So I'll be the first okay. to tell you, blocking <laughs> blue light all the way all day is bad. Now, when you're sitting in an office under bright LED lights looking at a bright screen, you're getting excessive doses, like five times more of the blue light than your eyes are used to getting. And you should expect to have a tired brain with sugar cravings at the end of the day. So many people get that. So I make glasses, the company's called True Dark, and during the day they block some blue light, but not all. And there's patented glasses for sleep and jet lag uh, that are on the site. And those are the glasses that for me doubled my deep sleep. They go beyond blue blockers. Blue blockers okay. at night don't block three of the four frequencies that keep your brain believing it's huh. daytime. Uh, so when you trick your brain into thinking it's pitch black, even though you're looking at your phone or watching TV, then when you lay down, you really go to sleep. And I see it in my sleep score. I, I fall right into deep sleep, and I'll get my deep sleep right away instead of waiting an hour or two like most people. And you also get into some other types of light that can affect the body and mind for better or worse. Uh, can you walk us through those? Uh, sure. We're getting to the point of, of sort of science fiction, and we can now create light in whatever wavelength we want. So there are species, or species, there are frequencies of red light and infrared light that are shown in multiple studies, even amber light, to cause regeneration of your skin or even injuries way faster than if you didn't use the light. So you can lay down on a red light bed. And in fact, part of uh, Bulletproof, I started a company called Upgrade Labs in Santa Monica and in Beverly or in Beverly Hills in the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Uh, which is you know, where the Golden Globes are are held. And right. <laughs> you you go there and you can use this red light to actually cause your skin to get better. And who would have thought that that was possible? And there are devices you can get at home that also allow you to do this. So we're just entering this area of, wait, we know the signal that causes the skin to get healthier and thicker. What other signals are waiting out there that we can use to cause us to get younger? That's just the beginning. Toward the end of the book, you actually have a chapter called Hack Longevity Like a Russian. I wouldn't think that we'd want to be taking longevity tips from a country experiencing sharp declines in life expectancy, but do they know something that we don't? You know, Russian scientists are some of the world's best. And if you look at physicists, really? uh, you look at it's just the advance, even going back to uh, the nuclear program, the fact that they didn't invest for 20 or 30 years uh, is problematic, but... One of the first things I ever did to improve my sleep was straight out of the Russian space program. They, they figured out uh, – I'm going to hack my Russian accent and piss off all my Russian friends. But, you know, <laughs> it, it, it is expensive to send astronaut to space. OK, I'm going to stop trying to do that. But anyway, <laughs> it is expensive because astronauts are heavy. So they said, what if we just made it so they didn't have to sleep when they're in space? We could send one-third less astronauts, one-third less food, one-third less astronaut diapers, like all the stuff. So <laughs> – they made us a machine. They could run electricity over the, the astronaut's brain, and they'd only need two hours of sleep. I said, I'm buying me one of those. So I did the 20-something years ago, and it works. Uh, and, really? Oh, yeah. What does it do? It, it runs a small current that forces the brain to go into a certain state and increases energy in the brain. It's sort of the great huh. granddaddy of, of technologies like Halo Neuroscience. This is a company that mm. makes electrical stimulation for athletes so you can learn to move more quickly to increase neuroplasticity. So Russians, Fascinating. They, they think about hacking very differently than most other scientists. And what they found out in that chapter on hacking 
uh, hacking your aging like uh, like a Russian, as they said, well, let's look at radical anti-aging. There's almost a fearlessness and in their willingness to just go deep on their own bodies. And one of the Russian scientists figured out that peptides, these tiny little strings of amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins, they are signaling molecules in the body. And they figured out how to get the young things that cause tissue regeneration and to extract those and to allow you to take them. So you can take the the peptides that cause you to grow better blood vessels or cause you to grow better eyes or better reproductive organs, and they actually work, and there's good science behind it. One of the things that was first published in 2003, something that I used, is called epitalin. And you might have heard of telomeres, this idea that your cells can only, sure. you know, they can only copy themselves so many times before they run out of right. this wick. Well, there's right, a- Right, the shoelace caps, right? Exactly. <laughs> shoelace caps, yeah. good way to describe it. Well, there's a $2,000 a month supplement uh, that you can take uh, that I did take for a while, although I bought a Chinese version of it. Uh, it's just not affordable, uh, even if you're doing pretty well, you know, $24,000 a year. Uh, so that's not going to be out there. And it's expensive because it takes 45 pounds of astragalus root to make a little bit of it. But the, the Russian peptide is 50 bucks, and you inject it for 10 days. So it's $50 for a 10 days dose. Uh, we do it once every six months, and it lengthens telomeres at least as well. Is it approved? Okay. No. Is it used commonly? Yes. Has it been studied for 17 years? Yes. Is it naturally present in your body when you're young? Yes. <laughs> it looks safer than most <laughs> drugs to me. <laughs> so okay, there's some cool stuff well, going on, but most people have never heard yeah. of it. Well, you know, I had Elizabeth Blackburn, the person who discovered the effects of telomeres, on the show a while back. And one thing she said is that some of these drugs – that uh, lengthen our telomeres also have this side effect of increasing the chance of cancer. So is that something that concerns you? I'm so you? glad you said that. It, if you turn on unchecked reproduction and regeneration, you bet your ass you're looking at cancer. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do anytime you're looking to live a long time, remember, cancer is one of the top two of the four killers. You're right. probably going to get it anyway. So maybe you should be managing your cancer risk in a more, uh, in a more conscious way. So what I did, as I said, well, what takes out precancerous cells and what causes cancer? The primary cause of cancer is mitochondrial dysfunction. And so you look at how do you make your mitochondria work better? That reduces your risks of almost all kinds of cancer. And what else can you do? Well, your natural killer cells run around and kill precancer cells. How do you get more natural killer cells? Well, the crazy billionaire way is what I did for the book is I had my blood drawn. Uh, cultured in a lab for a couple months, and my natural killer cells farmed and grown and copied. And then I sat down and injected 2 billion of my natural killer cells in all at once into my blood. And that resets your immune system to make you about 20 years younger than you were before. Uh, very powerful stuff you can do that way. However, that's you got to go out of the country to get your blood reinjected because in the U.S., once the blood's out of your body for 24 hours, it magically, through the power of big pharma lobbying, uh, becomes a, a drug that's no longer yours. Oh, wow. I, I don't understand the magic there, but I know it's expensive, uh. so I just leave the country where it's normal. But here's the cheap version of that. You want more natural killer cells? Go for a walk in the forest, 20% increase in natural killer cells, or use essential oils based on the spruce species. Hiroki spruce is the most studied. So for 25 bucks, you get a 20% increase in natural killer cells, and then lengthening your telomeres and stop eating the fried stuff. Don't smoke. Don't drink too much. You'll be fine. Okay, good tips. I'll go for the $25 version. <laughs> Before we go here, <laughs> real quickly, I have to ask, are there any treatments that you tried and later wished you hadn't? You know, some of the cryotherapy uh, that I, I went through, I fell asleep with ice packs uh -huh. on uh, some of the fat stores, and I got uh, first-degree ice burns over 15% of my body. <laughs> um, after I did the, the six-hands whole-body stem cell treatment in, in Park City, it was profoundly rejuvenating. I can tell you the day after I did it, I was laying there. I, I was pretty sore. Yeah. <laughs> so for about an hour there, I'm like, what did I do? But by the next day, I was completely back up and feeling better than before. Okay. All right. Well, that's the cost of living forever, I guess. Well, folks, again, Dave Asprey's book is called Superhuman, The Bulletproof Plan to Age Backward and Maybe Even Live Forever. Dave, thanks for talking with me. And good luck reaching 180. <laughs> at least, my friend, at least. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again to Dave Asprey for coming on the podcast. 
order his new book, Superhuman, the bulletproof plan to age backward and maybe even live forever on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books are sold. Subscribe to his podcast, Bulletproof Radio, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen, and you can keep up with him at Bulletproof.com or on Twitter at at BulletproofExec. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and rate and review us while you're there. Five-star ratings and detailed reviews are one of the best ways for new listeners to discover the show. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at at KickAssNewsPod and recommend us to your friends on your social media. For more fun stuff, visit KickAssNews.com and I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at KickAssNews.com. For now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass News.